Hello, everyone. Welcome to this North Carolina Botanical Garden Lunchbox Talk. I'm Joanna Massey Lalikas. I'm the Director of Learning and Community Engagement with the Garden, and we're really excited to have you all joining us today for this really great special talk with Chris Smith. I'm joined in this Zoom today by David Michaud. He'll be on the Zoom to answer any technical questions that may come up uh, with the Zoom, uh, the Zoom application, and we'll also assist our speaker with Q&A from you all at the end of the talk. We have folks today tuning in from across the Carolinas, as well as folks from California, Oregon, Texas, Georgia, Tennessee, Indiana, Florida, and Colorado. And we really thank you all for being with us today. Well, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Chris Smith. Chris is the executive executive director of the Utopian Seed Project, a crop trialing nonprofit working to celebrate food and farming. Within his work, uh, Chris collaborates on the Heirloom Collar Project, hosts a seasonal trial to table event series and publishes Crop Stories, a crop specific multimedia project. His book, The Whole Okra, won a James Beard Foundation Award in 2020. And he is the co-host of the Okra podcast. In 2023, Chris received the Organic Educator Award from the Organic Grower School and was named a champion of conservation by Garden and Gun Magazine. Now I'd like to welcome Chris. Chris, open your video and thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna share my screen and jump right into this. Um, so very happy to be here. We've got uh, about an hour or so, and I want to leave some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, jump straight into this presentation, which is going to focus on okra and collards and kind of saving and savoring those as kind of traditional southern vegetables. But um, but I just want you to know from the start that this is like a, a subset of the work that I've been working on uh and you can really apply a lot of what we're going to talk about to, to any crop type, any vegetable, any fruit, and in any region as well. So if you're tuning in from somewhere outside of the Carolinas, uh, or your passion crop is something other than collards or okra, I'm hoping you can still uh, take a lot of good things away from this presentation and start doing regional work or crop specific work yourself. So, uh, I guess in, in terms of talking about those passion crops, um, I, I have to be upfront and honest that okra is the crop that I am deeply in love with. And, and we will talk a little bit about it in the second half of the presentation in terms of saving and savoring. But I just wanted to ground the beginning of the conversation with a little bit of my personal history with okra. Um, and I feel like we can't talk about these crops with like true authenticity if we don't look at where they've come from. We're going to talk a lot about where we can go with these crops, certainly in uh, you know our own regions and our own culinary cultures, and uh, certainly in regards to climate resilient food systems and, and all these types of things, we're going to dig into some of those ideas. But um, acknowledging that okra is a crop that, while we may think of it as a traditional Southern crop, has a deep history uh, really across the tropics. It's got a real strong foundation in Asia, a, a kind of a wild relative center of diversity in Northeastern India, but across Southeast Asia, China, um, just a strong presence. Also a real strong presence in Africa, um, the center of uh, kind of domestication is likely to have been East Africa. Uh, it's it's this happened a long time ago so no one's really sure exactly its true origins but um certainly a, a lot of work has been done on okra in east africa and then it's traveled across the continent and has a real strong presence in west africa and then it's west africa where okra was taken during the mid-atlantic slave trade and brought across the americas kind of starting in south america and brazil still a strong okra culture in Brazil, came up through the Caribbean and into North America. And that's how it kind of became known as a traditional Southern crop. Uh, it was introduced uh, by enslaved people into the Southeast United States. Uh, and 
I think it's important to know those things. One is to, to respect that heritage. It's easy to get locked in our own kind of agricultural and culinary bubbles. Uh, but also in terms of just being more expansive with the crop, there's there's so much history and so much work being done on it and so many other ways to enjoy these crops, whether it's okra or collards or, or whatever, that um, just zooming out and getting a bigger picture, I think, is a real healthy place to start from. So um, to go in the opposite direction, I just I'm going to whistle stop tour through just a little bit of my okra highlights to ground us in some of the work that I've done, and then we're going to jump into the bulk of the presentation. So one of the one of the things I like to focus on, and, and certainly the, the book, The Whole Okra, is kind of literally the whole okra. It's about exploring the whole plant and how with many of the crops that we grow, and certainly with okra, the whole plant is either edible or useful on some level. Uh, and so I just wanted to just kind of demonstrate that a little bit uh, with these quick pictures. One, we got the cotyledons on the left here. Okra is a microgreen, so the leaves are totally edible and actually like really nutritious. There's a higher protein content in the leaves than there are in, in the pods. Uh, and you can eat the leaves all the way through to maturity. And one dish we've been working on, I work with a lot of chefs, is kind of like a faux seaweed salad where we take the leaves and really finely cut them. And then some of that mucilage comes out like a seaweed salad. And then we put a kind of a ginger tamari dressing on it. And it, I, I think people would be convinced that it was a seaweed salad if we weren't telling them that they were actually eating okra leaves and not seaweed. So I, th there's a lot of potential in eating the leaves and a lot of deep nutrition. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the pod. Most of the time when you say okra to somebody, it's that small green pod that will jump into their heads. Uh, we're going to dig a bit more into varietal diversity later in the presentation. So I'm going to save the pod exploration for that. But just, just remember that map in the last slide. If you're kind of stuck in an okra loop of, you know, fried okra, gumbo, pickled okra, which I think are probably the three chief Southern ways to do it. Um, then yeah, just remember that there's cultures and cuisines across the world that use okra in lots and lots of different ways. And there's plenty, plenty of exploration to be had there. So the, the flower also edible, it's, uh, like the coupon code mallow, like okra is part of the mallow family and, uh, is generally a fairly safe plant family to, to consume. Uh, so Usually I take these flowers and dry them for tea, but they can also be infused into vinegars and vodkas and beautiful red color comes out. We make okra flower vinegar, which is a just a deep red hue to that vinegar. Uh, but to be honest, because they don't have a lot of, they don't, they don't have a long shelf life, then usually I harvest okra flowers and dry them and, and have them as a tea. Plenty of um, academic papers showing the nutritive properties as a kind of like, an herbal medicinal, uh, certainly used in, in China. You can buy big bags of dried okra flowers, um, fairly similar to other hibiscus plants. So the flowers, flowers great. Next time, it's a bit late now, I think. Well, it certainly is for us. We already had a frost, so our okra flowers are over, but maybe in other parts of the country. But I, I encourage everyone to go out and eat an okra flower. Um, it's kind of got like an, a subtle okra taste, and you can eat it eat it raw. And then this picture on the right is kind of where I'm really excited at the moment. I think in terms of okra having a, a big food systems impact, one of its largest potential roots is using it as a, like a kind of a pseudo grain. And so the seed itself has a really good macronutritional profile, uh, is very high yielding and can be used as a, as a flower. It can be pressed as an oil. Um, and then all those different spin-off applications in terms of like breads and pastries and muffins and, and everything really. And it's a gluten-free flour, but because of the mucilage that's in all parts of the plant, then it has a little bit of that glutinous tendency. So bakers that use this as a flour kind of appreciate that it's got some of those qualities, certainly in bread baking where you need a little bit of that draw. Um, so it's I, I think it's a high potential flour product. And then this okra seed oil. It's kind of like a high value artisanal oil at present. There's only one person pressing it in America and that's 
Clay Oliver of Oliver Farms. And it's, we've actually just done a tasting with a, a couple of hundred people came through and tasted it. And things like a hickory nut, sesame seed oil, like a, a real nuttiness, a little bit of spice on the back end, uh, olive oil like, you know, all these kind of real positive flavor profiles were being discussed about this oil, which can be grown very easily in the South, doesn't need a whole bunch of irrigation, doesn't really come down with a lot of pests and diseases. And so a lot of potential to put high acreage into okra production to have a, like an olive oil of the South type of concept. Plus there's the, the, um, the flower potential as well. So good, good possibilities here. There's a picture of an okra seed flower sourdough that a local baker made for us. They're using about 20, 25% okra flour mixed with standard bread flour, um, which brings in kind of like a, a biofortification concept. A, a lot of kind of West African countries are using okra seed flour to biofortify and diversify their diets in standard wheat flour bread production. So some good good potential in that direction. And then these oyster mushrooms are obviously not okra, but when you process a whole bunch of seeds for okra, I, I wish I'd actually had one on my desk. Usually there's one lying around. Oh, there is. The benefit of being obsessed with okra. So when you harvest uh, okra pods for seeds, you get these big dried pods and then you pull them apart and all the seeds fall out and then you're left with a whole bunch of woody chaff. Um one it burns really hot so it's great fire starter if you've got a home uh, wood stove but what we often do with them is take all those all that chaff all that detritus and pods and sterilize them and inoculate them with oyster mycelium and these oyster mushrooms are growing on basically spent okra pods so just trying to keep things in the food system slow down that kind of like waste stream uh, and then grow something useful on what would otherwise be a, a waste product so lots, every, everything can be used. I wasn't lying. Um, and then two fun ones to finish, and then we'll we'll get into the collards. On the left, we have okra petiole straws. And the petiole is the part of the plant that joins the stem to the leaf. And it happens that some varieties, it's a hollow petiole. And if, certainly if you're doing leaf harvest for food, then you can chop the whole petiole off use the leaf for whatever you want and then you're left with this like straw basically and I cut it into six inch sections and dehydrate it and you have this storable biodegradable homegrown straw. Uh, the fun fact with these is that the mucilage that's in all parts of the plant also has some antimicrobial properties so as you drink from this straw then a little bit of that slime comes back and so during COVID I was trying to market these as shareable straws and the business concept did not take off if anybody wants to run with it, you're welcome to. But that microbial activity makes these a pretty, pretty unique straw, I guess. I'm kind of half joking there. I can't see any of you, so I don't know if you're groaning or rolling your eyes. Um, so, but we do take these to events and and use them like as actual straws. So it's it it is more than just a gimmick. And then on the right hand side, we have a local uh, weaving friend where we've extracted the bast fiber which is the the fiber just below the bark on the stem stalks of the okra you can go through a standard process like you would with any other bast fiber like flax or hemp and then you you get these long fibers which then you can clean up and basically give to somebody that knows how to use a spinning wheel and they made a whole skein of okra fiber and then i sent this off with another friend who was going to put it through a loom and I don't think she's actually done it yet. So we're kind of still work in process, but technically you could make a homegrown cloth from okra fiber, or it's got a whole bunch of industrial applications, kind of like hemp fiber is used in building materials and you can build a hemp fiber composite tractor. There's no, nothing stopping the same application being used by okra fiber because it's got similar tensile strength to hemp fiber. So, so much potential in this crop that usually we reduce to a small green pod. And actually, sometimes we don't even enjoy the small green pod because there's a lot of okra haters out there. 
So this is all part of changing the narrative. If we're going to go to the effort of growing crops, then the crops need to be grown in a way that is sustainable. And Okra leans into that very heavily and then using that whole plant so that we're maximizing those inputs. So that's my that's my quick okra spiel. Um, and we're going to circle back around to okra, but I want to shift gears into the work of the Utopian Sea Project, specifically through the lens of some of the stuff we've done with collards. So the Utopian Sea Project, basically, its mission is tr to try and increase the amount of agrobiodiversity in food and farming in Western North Carolina. Now, we, we spill over often and have a bit more of a, a Southeast scope. But really, when it comes down to it, we're trying to get more farmers growing more varieties and more types of crops in our region. And the reason we want more diversity in the food system is because diversity is kind of like a pillar of resilience. And as we see more food system shocks or extreme weather events through climate change, then we need to have a higher degree of climate resilience. And that requires more diversity in the food system. If there's just one crop being grown, then one thing can take out that whole crop. But if we've got lots of different crops and lots of different varieties and lots of different genetics, then we're in a place where we have one, a high climate adaptive capacity of that food system and two, a high resilience within that system to um, respond to whatever environmental pressure is is causing an ill effect on that food system. So that, that bit's a little bit heady, but we're going to get into specifics. And hopefully you'll see as we go through like the college journey, um, exactly what it is we're up to uh, in, in the fields and, and in our community. And then I, I kind of wanted to ground us in this quote. I'm, I don't have a lot of text in these slides, but I, I feel like this is a good starting place just to show that this is this is an important avenue of exploration and, and we're not the only ones working on it. So ensuring food security, adapting to climate change, reducing environmental environmental degradation, protecting nutritional security, reducing poverty, and ensuring sustainable agriculture are just six reasons why it matters to conserve crop diversity. So very, you know, lofty statement in terms of the importance of crop diversity, I've underlined conserve because I think conservation done right is important, but hopefully what I'm going to show you is that we're working on not just conserving that crop diversity, but how do we apply it in the communities? How do we take that diversity and really make it work for us in terms of being environmental, climate, culinary, nutritional, like all the things that we need to do to address some of the problems in the food and farming system can be addressed through diversity. Um, but it's more than just conservation. It's it's like applied conservation. Uh, we have a farmer friend that talks about conservation through consumption. So how do we get people to like actively engage with this diversity and not just have it be conserved in a seed bank somewhere where one day it may be useful. I'm like, it needs to be useful today. Uh, so we're going to, again, we're going to get into that as we talk about collards. So basically the next section, I, I want to take you through like our journey with collards. And so you, hopefully you'll see the progression of what we've been up to. Uh, and then this is what I feel like anybody can take this and apply it anywhere with any crop. We're, we're lucky to be part of a, a real broad collaboration called the Heirloom Collar Project, where we have some pretty awesome people working with us. You can see, I'm, I think I'm covering up their logos. Let's get, do them due justice. There you go. So we've got um, Working Food, Utopian Seed Project, Ujama Seeds, Seed Savers Exchange, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange are just some of the organizational partners. But then we have a whole bunch of like really incredible individuals also part of this project. And so we've come together to really promote a diverse collection of collards. So I'm going to jump forward here and speak a little bit to the idea of institutional conservation. So, so to give you the zoomed out concept of the Ellen Collar Project, 
about 20, well, 20, 25 years ago now, a group of researchers realized that there wasn't a lot of genetic colored diversity stored by the USDA. And the Brassica geneticists and researchers were like, why don't we have any colors? We've got other Brassicas, but we don't have many colors. And so they basically got a grant to drive around the Southeast looking for colored diversity. And whenever they found basically a, a backyard garden where they saw collards, they'd go and knock on the door and say, hey, we noticed you're growing collards. Can we talk a little bit about them? And often they'd find people that had been stewarding collard seeds for, for decades, if not more. And, and they asked if they would share some seeds and most people said yes. Um, and they ended up collecting just a huge amount of beautiful genetic diversity in the form of collard seeds across the Southeast, although somewhat interestingly, highly concentrated in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, they went on to write a book called Collards and they talk about the collared belt being kind of like Eastern North Carolina and into, I guess, Northeastern South Carolina. So um, so all of this beautiful collar diversity was, was conserved and sent to the USDA and it was put into their gene banks. And one interesting part of this is that the the seed savers were all elderly. They were, their average age was in the 70s. And most of them reported that they didn't have anyone to pass their seeds on to. And again, we're 25 years on now. And we've just recently tried to reconnect with a lot of these seed savers by sending out letters. And most of them came back, returned, unopened. We had a few people reporting that they'd already passed away. And you know, the assumption is that a lot of these elderly seed savers have died. And we knew that they were unlikely to pass their seeds on to anyone. So the seeds probably would have died with them. And so this beautiful diversity of about 90 varieties that was collected legitimately could have been lost. Uh, and this USDA plant collecting trip saved them. So that's that's all well and good. And I'm very grateful for that trip that it happened, but it kind of, it's it's more complex than that because they took those seeds and they put them in the USDA and they were saved in the USDA, but they kind of not much happened with them. Some academics pulled them out and did trials and looked at the genetics and, and could have gone on to do, you know, good academic stuff. But the communities in which those collards were kept, effectively, the collards would have been lost to those communities once those seed keepers had left. And so um, in about 2016, Ira Wallace, a friend of ours that works on this collard project, was lucky enough to see one of those big trials that happened in the USDA and witness the diversity. And she was like, oh my gosh, so we, we've got to do something to get these collards back to the people. And so what happened, that was basically the beginning of the LM Collar Project where we, uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Seed Savers Exchange um, started working on pulling those seeds back out of the USDA, regenerating them so there's enough seeds to then redistribute back to the communities. And in a nutshell, the whole Ellum Collar project is about reinvigorating those seeds back into the communities. So one of the projects we've done is to take these beautiful varieties and um, do our own trials on them so that we can showcase how beautiful they are. In 2020, we did it as a big community project where we had I think it was about 250 people across the country signed up to receive three varieties out of a collection of 20 that we had enough seeds to distribute. And then they all grew them out and then we compared notes and it was this big, fun community project. And then eight farm sites across the country grew all 20 varieties. So we were one of those farm sites in, in Western North Carolina and we were lucky enough to grow all 20 varieties and we actually added one of our own in that we'd been stewarding so we had 21 varieties and it was just it was just stunning to see the diversity in the field and um and just witness that you kind of like the okra even when we think about collards we just think of a fairly standard flat green leaf but actually there was lots of different leaf shapes and colors and sizes and plant formations and um to experience that and then to showcase it is a big part of our work. So here's here's some of those varieties um, on display. 
In fact, that's all the 21 varieties on display. And what we did in, in terms of reinvigorating them back into the communities, then I really feel like food is the the easiest way to convince people that this level of diversity is, is good and, and we should engage with it. And that, that conservation by consumption idea is definitely a recurring theme. So we work with local chefs and we ended up doing a few videos and hosting a collard week. And you can still see these videos online. If you go to heirloomcollards.org, you can go back and see history and culture of collards by Michael Twitty, seed saving of collards by Amira Mitchell. And then this is chef Ashley Shanti, who's on our board and works with us with the collards, who did a cooking demo on using collards in various ways. So we do taste tests and we do recipes and we do dishes. Uh, and some of those recipes are looking backwards and like what, are, what was our grandmothers doing with collards and what's the cultural culinary history of collards, but also looking forward and like people using collards as wraps and raw collard salads and, and these other things. And actually just yesterday I interviewed a couple of farmers from the Lumbee Nation in Eastern North Carolina about the collard sandwich and how that's such a, a deep embedded culturally culinary component of that area. So lots, lots of different food explorations for sure. Now, that variety trialing and looking at a bunch of different varieties and, and making assessments and that kind of stuff is, is fairly standard work. People are still surprised when they know that there's hundreds of varieties of collards and thousands of varieties of okra, but um, there's nothing too revolutionary about that. But I think this this quote is really important um, as we shift to the, like the, the next stage, like what's after the variety trial. This is Dr. Carrie Fowler, who was um, in part responsible for setting up the Svalbard um, Global Seed Bank and has done a lot of important work with seeds. And he said, with diversified crop species and varieties, farmers can adapt crops and their livelihoods to changing environments. So for me, this is like a, a key paradigm shift where I don't know if we've got gardeners and farmers in the room, but uh what we often see in the world of sustainable agriculture is relatively small subset of varieties that are grown by most farmers. There's not like a huge amount of varietal diversity or crop diversity when we go to farmers markets, more than the supermarket for sure, but not, not massive, not compared to the hundreds of varieties that are available. And so what tends to happen, and this is a generalization, so there's definitely farmers not doing this, but the, the way we're taught to farm is to modify our environment to suit those crops. And by that, I mean like we need to irrigate or maybe we need to put up a greenhouse or maybe we're on a, a spray schedule with fungicides or herbicides or pesticides or a fertilization schedule. All, all these things are externalized inputs produced off the farm usually and brought in to modify the environment that we have to suit the crop that we're trying to grow. So that's that's fairly standard crop production. But what Dr. Kari Fowler is saying here is that if we have diversified crop species and varieties, then we have the potential for those crops and varieties to change and adapt to suit the environmental conditions that we have. And if we embrace that as a baseline philosophy, then we can lean into the, the power of the seeds to change to suit the environment in a way that reduces our need for those externalized inputs. So on our farm, we're not irrigating, we're not spraying, we're not, we're barely fertilizing. We do a little bit of compost application and we try and have a cover crop rotation, but we're doing very low input management to see if these crops are able to cope in those environments and then to work with them over time to adapt and select the crops to cope in, in a low input environment. And to me, that's way more sustainable. And so for those collards, one of the, one of the awesome things that I saw when I grew those 21 varieties of collards is yes, there was diversity between the varieties, but there was a lot of intra varietal diversity as well. So within each variety block, we saw a lot of, genetic diversity. They, they were obviously one variety, but they weren't hyper uniform. And because they weren't hyper uniform, then we knew there was genetic differences between each of those plants. And so as a clear example of this, or like the power of this diversity in the terms of 
being able to rapidly adapt to change, then we have we had one farmer who was participating in that 2020 trial who grew three varieties, and one of the varieties was Tabitha Dykes. And this was this picture on the left is kind of what what the original type looked like. It had you know this beautiful purple coloration through the stem, a little bit making it into the leaves. Again, there was some diversity within that leaf shape. A lot of chefs loved this variety because it was so sweet and tender. It was a it was a top pick among chefs. But when um, a friend Sandy, the footnote farmer, is actually in the Durham Chapel Hill area, uh, she, when she grew out a whole row of these collards, she noticed that some of the collards were more purple than others. And she runs a CSA program and handed out the collards to her CSA members. And the feedback she got was that the people loved it when they got the purple collards. So she was like, oh, okay, when these cro this crop goes to seed, I'm just going to save seeds from the purple varieties or the more purple varieties. And so that's what she did. She saved the seeds and then they're the ones that she planted out. And then she did the same again because the following year, there was a higher incidence of purple in the population. The CSA customers continue to give her really good feedback. She saves seeds from those ones. And what you're seeing here is just two years difference from the picture on the left of the original seeds through to her purple selection on the right where she's getting these deeply colored purple leaves. And so basically because there was a high amount of beginning diversity, that crop was rapidly able to change to what she wanted just through very simple um, selective seed saving. And so I think, I think that's a pretty remarkable change. Uh, and it was facilitated by the original genetic diversity. That's an important piece. Because if you're growing something that's very narrow genetics, it's it's quite homogenous, or it's been inbred over a long, long period of time, then if there's not much genetic wiggle room in that variety, then you, you're going to be able to shift it a little bit slowly over time, but you're not going to be able to shift it a lot. But if you've got a big genetic reservoir, you've got high diversity, in that population, then you've got way more selection possibilities and you're gonna be able to shift much more quickly. And so that's that's another kind of foundational concept when we talk about diversity as a core component of resiliency in food and farming systems. So I wish I, I, wish I had pictures for this, but what, what happened to us was we had those 21 varieties in the field and we did out, we weren't going to save seeds from them. We were just going forward with our um, variety trial assessments, tastings, those types of things. But we we got to the winter and the information was in and we were kind of like, cool, we're done with that project. But we didn't need the section where they were planted. So we just let them go into the winter. We were like, you know, we'll just let them go. And sometime that year, December, January, there was a a really warm spell where it was in the 70s for a couple of weeks and then it plummeted down to eight Fahrenheit and in my head I live a couple of miles away from the farm and in my head I was like well there goes the collards uh, and when I went to the field I fully expected to walk down the collard row and just see like plant mush everywhere eight Fahrenheit is pretty low for a collard to survive and that's without the huge temperature swing. So like a, a 70 Fahrenheit temperature swing is, is massive. Um, so I didn't expect any survivors. But when I walked down that row where all these different blocks of varieties were planted, then it would be like mush, 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 survivor, survivor, mush, survivor. You know, it was randomly distributed surviving plants amongst all the different varieties. And so because they're all planted together, then it was pretty obvious that it was a genetic difference that allowed one plant to go to mush as expected and one to act as if there hadn't been an Arctic blast the night before. So because there was huge distribution across all the varieties, we decided to just see which ones would survive the winter and let them all go to flower and then into cross. And that was the somewhat accidental and serendipitous start of what has become known as an ultra cross breeding project where we've just allowed like extreme environmental conditions to make selection pressure on a highly diverse genetic population and then save seeds from the survivors. And again, this isn't revolutionary. This is like literally how seeds have been saved for a long time 
It's only a very recent past that we've gone towards hyper uniformity within varieties. And so having this real broad base of genetics gives us that adaptive capacity, rapid adaptive capacity, which is, you know, I'd argue necessary in our times of climate chaos um, and lets us select for, you know, for us environmental conditions, but anybody could do anything with this population of collards. Uh, and people have, people have started selecting for just a purple population, uh, a broad purple population, or you could select for flavor or plant structure, plant shape, disease resistance, all the important things, this broad genetic base gives us the option to kind of like be empowered to make those selections. So we, we save seeds from them. We ended up with about eight pounds of seeds, which could plant, you know, thousands of acres of collards. Seeds are very generous in that respect. So this is, you know, quite a liberating project. And then we took a lot of those seeds and distributed them to local community gardens to start like re-empowering local seed saving efforts. Uh, and so this is just a, one of our local giving gardens that grew the ultra cross collards. Uh, and you can kind of see a little bit there, the different colorations in the leaves uh, as they're coming through. And this was year one. It's, it's amazing to be three years on and continue to see the changes coming through in those populations. And so in that first year, we we worked with, this is Ira Wallace and Southern Exposure Seed Exchange to distribute those ultra cross collards. And, you know, over 500 people bought packets in that first year. And you can see this is a distribution of all those people. So they've gone all over the country. And each one of these dots represents the potential, almost in my mind, like infinite potential for the recombination of all those genetics, like hyperdiversity for those people to kind of like begin their own seed story with these diverse genetics to like plant them in place and have regional adaptation or personal selective adaptation uh, all over the country. So instead of having this like 90 varieties, which are important to conserve, we now have the potential for as many varieties as anybody wants to take the time to grow and select for. And that's really exciting in terms of like it's a different way to conserve diversity. It's not within a single variety in a gene bank. This is like massive genetic distribution across the whole country where seed savers can do whatever they want to do with them. And so zooming in on the Southeast where obviously there's a, a colored concentration, the purple dots are institutions that are working with them and the blue dots are individuals. Um, and here's our local region here around Asheville and you can see Oh, I'm covering up Durham, but there's a good amount of people around your area too. Okay, so so that's that, that that's our trajectory from variety trials all the way through to you know seed selection assessment, culinary evaluation into massive genetic shakeup and then redistribution to infuse and empower communities to uh, have their own seed saving journey with the. Uh, you know in whatever direction they want kind of like choose your own adventure concept okay so i'm going to circle back to okra now um you'll see some repeat themes here with what we've done with okra so i'm going to go through okra a little more quickly but there's a few things to pull out uh, as we go through um, i'm hoping this picture shows you that okra is more than just a little green pod um that's that's one of my life missions is just to let people know that okra is diverse and beautiful as well uh this is from our 2018 trials where we just again did a variety trial a lot of times it just starts off with like what already exists out there let's look at the varieties that exist um and this is just 60 out of the thousands that could be grown and then again, we do taste testings, which are always super fun and an easy way to engage with folks. People like food. They like to taste food. Uh, we often work with chefs because they have, um, I, I don't always think chefs have like a better taste, although sometimes they do. What they do have is a better way to articulate those flavors and those tastes. So we get some really good information when we talk to chefs about these different varieties. They're able to put words to the flavors in a way that I always struggle with. But as soon as they say, oh yeah, this okra has a earthy overtone and hazelnut back taste, I'm like, oh my God, you're right. Why, why, why didn't I have the words to say that type of thing? Maybe it's just the power of suggestion. I don't know. 
Um, but they're fun events and it's a good way to explore diversity. Uh, and then I wanted to show you like kind of another direction that's that's not quite as crazy as the ultra cross uh, and still viable. And Hedy's Red is a Tennessee heirloom. It's one of my favorite red okras. It's just delicious, ranks highly in our taste test, productive, beautiful red plants, just a great variety. And then another variety I've pulled out of the USDA called Puerto Rican, Puerto Rico. It was called Evergreen. I've been making selections on it for about five years now uh, to bring the phenotype, the way the pods look, to more of a uniform nature. Uh, so it came out of the USDA with a, a bunch of different looking pods. And there was one that I kind of fell in love with, which was this shape where it's like a totally rounded pod. It's got a, a fuzzy velvetiness to the, the pod. This red blushing, I just really like. The plant was hyper early, like really early produce, about 50 days, and um, really, really tasty. People have eaten this okra and described it as having kind of like a sweet pea-like flavor. So definitely one of my favorites. And, and just to distinguish it from the USDA original seed stock, which was way more diverse than this, we renamed it Puerto Rican Everblush when we started selling these seeds through Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. So two of my favorite okras that I uh, have just done a very simple biparental cross. So I just took you know pollen from one variety and, and dabbed it on the flower of the other variety and then saved seeds from that. And that's another way to get like a genetic explosion. Once you save the seeds from that cross, then you get all the different potential genetic recombinations shaking up. And I don't actually have a picture of it, but this is the first year we've grown out a big population of the children of this cross. And it's just a joy to walk through the field and see, you know, you can kind of tell, oh, that came from Puerto Rican Everblush, that came from Anahini's Red. And I'm actually looking for like a, a pod shape like this, that's a solid red or pink color. And that's the one I'm going for that still tastes delicious and is early and productive. Um, so uh, other ways to kind of like explore and 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 create your own seed story going forward. It's very easy, accessible stuff. This isn't crazy science. Um, one thing I wanted to, or, or I'm always keen to throw in the mix in this diversity discussion is uh, like related species diversity is, is a big thing. Most of the okra grown in America is Abelmotius esculentus, which is the standard okra we all know. But it turns out that there's like a related species of okra called Abelmotius cali. Uh, let me move this again so you can see. Um, that John Jackson came across a, a, some seeds of this from uh, Liberia. His mother grew up in Liberia. And so he calls this motherland okra because it's okra from his mother's land. And he got some seeds over and grew it out and sent me a picture of it and was like, look at this okra, it's really interesting. And I was like, so excited to see it because I recognized it to be Abelmotius Cali, which is a West African okra, which is actually indigenous to West Africa. Um, the other okra, Abelmotius esculentus, is probably East Africa, maybe originating in Asia, but this one is truly indigenous to West Africa and has, <clears throat> it's a late season producer that has higher drought tolerance and um, higher drought tolerance and disease resistance and the leaves are smoother. So in terms of using this as an edible green, the West African okra is a better green than the spinier leaves of the Abelmotius esculentus. So slightly different traits that are worth exploring to bring again, more species and genetic diversity into our food systems. So always like to share about motherland okra. It's just some, oh, they get huge as well. That's one thing to remember. Like the plants in he grows in Georgia get enormous and the leaves are massive. Uh, and this is the most common leaf that we eat. Real beautiful pods. You can see I like it. I put three slides in about it. Slight, slightly different botanical changes. You can see this picture on the right of the pod that those kind of the epicalyx, that kind of like cup around the base of the pod, they're wider in Abelmotius cali. Other than that, it's kind of very similar and is often mistaken for Abelmotius esculentus. Okay, so with okra, 
We do similar projects in terms of this. It's very important for us to do community outreach and community empowerment work around seed saving and selection. I kind of have a, a feeling that there's a difference between seed saving for straight up preservation, where I'm just saving this so that we have it next year, versus what I think of as like objective-based seed saving or relational seed saving, where we are working with the crop over time to kind of co-evolve with that crop or co-develop with that crop. There's There's been this like real strong seed people relationship for like thousands of years, which feels like it's kind of been broken in the last hundred years or so through the commercialization of seed and um, seed companies and, and all that kind of thing. And so how do we reverse that a little bit? And I think part of it is like speaking to people about how they can develop their own relationship with the seeds uh, and often that's creating new varieties or selecting for specific things that are very personal to those people or those communities uh, and so this was just a fun project where we were group selecting a variety to be the palest pod we could find from a population and we sent out seeds again to like about 500 people across the country and all together we we asked everyone to send back their single palest pods. And then I brought them all back together and grew them out. And it was amazing how successful we were as a group in terms of advancing this kind of like plant selection goal as a large community. It would have taken me years to do it on my own, but I basically had like 500 people doing exactly what I was doing. And we made a massive leap forward in terms of getting towards the palest pod. And then it was somewhat natural that we would end up doing an ultra cross okra. So this is a field I was working in 2021 with Jordan Collins, who's another big okra researcher. And we grew out a hundred different varieties of okra. 85 of them were Abel Motius esculentis and we let them all cross. We also did variety preservation. So we saved seeds, pure seeds of all of them, but we let them all cross up and, um, and have saved the children of them. And that's actually a pretty crazy mix. Like when we planted that one out, we had like giant okra and dwarf okra and horrible gnarly spiny okra and beautiful colored okra. There's a lot going on in that mix. So genetic potential is huge. Um, people are working with that population. It's going to take a little bit of time to, to stabilize it to something that's really personable to them. But it's also given opportunities. I get a lot of folks asking if they can grow okra in the Pacific Northwest or further north or cold tolerant okra and these types of questions. And this, this ultra cross okra mix represents the best potential to select an okra to cope with like extreme conditions. So hopefully we can see more people growing okra in more places. Uh, so that's just some of our partners on that project. Ujama Seeds is well worth checking out an experimental farm network. Uh, are down there as people distributing the seeds and and working on us actively with those projects because now we're trying to do ultra cross sorghum, ultra cross squash, ultra cross southern peas, largely to support the work of Ujama Seeds, which is again a, gr a great organization you should check out. And just some of the beautiful diversity here. A seven petaled okra is somewhat unique since as, as a species it's known to be pentamerous, which is five petaled. And then this crazy dinosaur over on the left with those deep, deep ridges. So just shocking diversity coming out of the population, which is, is great to see. This is a, another related species, Tetraphyllus, that crossed into it. So now we have intraspecies, interspecies crossing. Um, and so just, yeah, fun explorations. So I'm going to leave you with the thought that, that, you know, that's two of our journeys with collards and okra. Uh, but really, this is like an open field. There are other places working on these types of ideas. And, and I hope people are inspired and empowered to like start their own journey. This is a, a dahlia breeding project we've been a part of for edible dahlia tubers. We work with a vast amount of sweet potato diversity. Um, and it's it's the same pattern with all of them. It's It's variety trials, it's tastings, it's agronomic information. And then it's like, how do we develop this and share it widely so more people can engage with this work? Uh, so yeah, explore your own is really where it's at. Oh, I, I would say if you're looking for seeds to start this, then we do have the ultra cross seeds, but there's you can look for breeders mixes, you can look for land race mixes. 
Um, sometimes they get called grexes, although that's kind of like botanically incorrect, but you, you'll find seeds labeled as some kind of mix to kind of allow you to jumpstart this journey. You don't necessarily, you don't have to source 85 different varieties to start this journey. People have already done the initial work and you can get the diverse genetics and grow them yourself. Okay. I'm going to stop there so that there's 10 minutes at the end for questions. If, if any have cropped up, um, and invite folks back into the room. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. I learned so, so much. And I have to be honest, became very hungry watching this presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, Q&A quite yet, but I invite those at home to uh, submit any questions you have for Chris. Um, one that came up for me throughout this presentation, and I, I hesitate to ask it because I myself am terrible at describing flavors. Um, but, but if you could speak to, you know, some of the different flavor profiles that you're, you're tasting with these different varieties, either for the okra or the collards. Yeah. One thing. So with the collards, one, we've had chefs that come down and we try and get them into the field so they can walk down and, and see and experience all the collards. One thing they're always looking for is, is sweetness. So they go down and they'll often pick out the collards that they think are sweetest. But then interestingly, they it, it's often not about, certainly with this level of diversity, it's not about the best variety. It's more about like matching a variety with a particular dish. So we had one, one guy, Jeremy Salig, that was doing an okra seed oil as a dressing for our dinner that we did. And he, um, there was one variety that he honed in on, and I forget which one it is now, but he was like, that, that will make the best okra seed oil. And I think it that wasn't the sweetest okra. So usually people would just go, oh, I've got to get the sweetest, got to get the sweetest, got to get the sweetest. But he had one that had some other complex flavor compounds. Uh, we got a lot of commentary on the the paler okras, like the white cabbage collards and the yellow cabbage collards being a good entry level collard because they're a much more mild taste. Whereas the more purple and blue collards with the uh, higher levels of anthocyanins tend to have like a, a bit more of an intense taste. And so if you're not really into collards, but you're kind of tempted, then go for a paler one versus a, a denser one, that type of thing. Um, with okra, it's it's fairly subtle in okra and it depends how you prep it. But I, I eat a lot of okra raw and I feel, I feel like it's similar to green beans. Like you can eat a lot of different green beans and occasionally you eat a green bean and you're just like, my God, that's blown my mind. Um, and I don't always have the words for it either, but like there's a certain like that was delicious factor. And so we look for that in the okra. And I think that's where the Puerto Rican Everblush comes in. And then when I've had chefs come through, that's it, that's the variety that I've had chefs tell me, oh, sweet pea. And, and that always stuck in my brain as like, oh, I wonder, can we bring more sweetness into okra as a, as a flavor compound? There's definitely a, a grassiness in younger okra. And then as you let them develop and the seeds start maturing, then the seeds have that nuttiness to them. And that's what we see coming through in the oil and the flour is a, is a nuttiness, which is very pleasant. All right. Some questions are starting to roll in now. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, one person's asking where to get seed mixes. And I think you, you mentioned the Experimental Farm Network. Um, are there other places folks should look for? Mixes? Yeah, it's it's actually kind of exciting. Um, over the last few years, I've seen more and more seed companies offering mixes. Um, and so it's definitely, again, this isn't a new concept, but it's like a re-emerging concept. And I think seed companies are realizing that this level of diversity is something that certainly home gardeners, like farmers have less of an ability to take risks because it's hard to farm and there's a bottom line. And I very much get that. I'm not saying farmers should suddenly start growing <laughs> fields and fields of crazy diversity, but home gardeners really have the ability to like plant a single bed of a real diverse mix and, and really, I guess, geek out on it. And, and seed companies, I think, are realizing that. So Southern Exposure Seed Exchange has some diversity mixes. Experimental Farm Network is pretty much all about that. Um, and their Ujama Seeds is a good one. Uh, this this year, 
Fedco Seeds uh, is writing an article in the catalog based on this whole idea of seed diversity that we spoke to them about. And they have a, a group of diverse mixes that they've been working with. Um, West Coast companies, I, I tend to try and support East Coast companies because that's where I am. But a lot of the West Coast companies have like been on this bandwagon for a while. There's a seed company called Adaptive Seeds, which is literally all about this kind of concept of um, diverse genetics and, and selection um, stuff going on. So I, I'd say once if, if you get your eye in and you start looking for mixes, breeders' mixes, land races, ultra cross type language, you'll probably find more than you'd expect. All right, another one that's come in um, is a comment that uh, most stores tend to only give variety names for apples. Um, do you see any effort uh, for having stores name varieties of all the veggies and fruits that they offer? That is, that's a great question. I would love to see more of that happening. Um, to, to some extent, the LM Collar Project is trying to trying to do that. But one one way we're going about it is if you if you go at somebody and say, like there's a like you go from just knowing one type of collard green and everything's just a collard green, and then you try and get them to go straight to varieties where there's like hundreds of varieties, then there's kind of like it's too much. So we're trying to take an intermediary step, which you see with some crops like tomatoes, where when you go, you don't see the variety of the tomato, but what you see is it's either a slicer or a cherry or a, a paste, you right? You see, you see subtypes, not necessarily varieties. And I feel like that's a good stepping stone. If we can get supermarkets to go towards subtypes, then that's one step closer to having people realizing and acknowledge that there's more than just one type of colored. And so we've broken the subtypes down into cabbage collards, heading collards, loose leaf collards. We've got colored collards to represent the purples and the blues. Um, and then there's actually a much smaller subset that we're working on of like frilly leaf collards that look more like kale than collards, but they're botanically collards and they've just got very ruffled, beautiful leaves. So um, that's that's where we're pushing. Same with okra, like sub subtypes before we go straight to varieties. But I would support a variety push too. Great. And one more question before we wrap up, possibly the most important one. What is your most favorite way to eat okra? Oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question to finish on. Um, I my okay, my go-to way, and this is just because I've got so much okra and I've got two young children, so not a lot of time, and I need to keep it fairly simple for those guys, is... um. I love taking okra and just slicing it down the middle, a little bit of oil and salt and baking it in a hot oven, like about 375 to 400, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, you can do this on a grill as well. And it kind of just, it makes them just crispy enough that they start to brown a little bit. And then some of that sweetness comes out there and you can just put that in a bowl in the middle of the table. Maybe you've got like a, aioli dip or something like that to go with it and those things my my daughters just they disappear from the table and they're just quick easy delicious that's my go-to okra recipe wonderful i'm gonna go preheat the oven i'll i'll hand <laughs> these over to joanna now great chris thank you so much this has been amazing um just the the spirit of the deep relationships between people and plants that have led to this diversity and maintain the diversity of the collards that was almost lost is just so powerful. And also understanding how home gardeners can have such a big impact uh, in preserving the diversity. And it's just a, an action item that folks can, I think, can really hold on to as to they can, they can make a difference in this and our food diversity. So thank you for sharing that. It's wonderful to see Ira Wallace in your presentation. She introduced us to the Collar Project when she spoke with us in about 2020. And so great to hear where that project has gone since then. And thank I'm just, the number of partnerships that you have um, is just so beautiful. So thank you. We hope to have you back to talk more about some of your other projects in the future. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of fun stuff to talk about.
and people can follow along online. So, you know, we, we try and stay updated on the social media. Excellent. All right. Well, I think our time is up and uh, look forward to seeing you again in, at our garden someday in the future. And thanks again. And thank you everybody for attending. We're grateful to have you with us. Thank you all.